Welcome to the Cardiovascular and Respiratory Assessment for the School Nurse. My name is Nabarban Lewis and I'm a Regional School Nurse Liaison with the Maine Department of Education. Let's first review some basic concepts, beginning with the respiratory system. This is where the body receives its oxygen, oxygen from. It is achieved by gas exchange at the alveolar level. That is where blood is oxygenated and carbon dioxide is removed. The heart is the primary organ of the circulatory system. The right side of the heart receives deoxygenated blood that comes from the body and the brain. It is then pumped into the lungs and it picks up oxygen. From there, it continues to the left side of the heart and back out to the brain and body with oxygenated blood. The heart receives its electrical impulse from the sinoatrial node, which is located in the right atrium. This electrical signal creates the events of one full contraction of the heart muscle. Now, moving on to receiving a student who is complaining of shortness of breath. The nursing assessment is going to begin with subjective assessment and objective. Let's start with a subjective assessment. This represents the student's perceptions, feelings, or concerns. It's also important to include other sources of information from family members or healthcare team members. Combining information of current and past history of respiratory health, illness, and medications can also help guide you in your assessment. Other factors may include the student's age, their family history, race, cultural preferences, environmental concerns, or other current health practices. Let's move forward with the example of a student with shortness of breath. Here are some questions that may guide you while you're assessing them. They may include what makes the shortness of breath go away. Is the, so, is the shortness of breath associated with any chest pain or discomfort? Find out if they have any triggers, any factors that they're exposed to at home, such as secondhand smoke. If they're an older student, are they involved in smoking or vaping? While you're doing your subjective assessment, as the nurse, you can also start beginning your objective assessment. And this is where you start getting information through a physical examination, observation, or diagnostic testing. This is any information that can be measured. For example, blood pressure, temperature, heart rate, overall appearance, and respiratory rate. The objective assessment involves inspection, palpation, and auscultation of the student. This is where you'll note their level of consciousness and how they're cooperating. Follow their breathing pattern. Is it shallow or deep? Noticing any retractions, purslip breathing, or any audible breaths. This is also a time where you may notice their chest expansion, whether it's symmetrical on inspiration and expiration. Looking at the coloration of their skin from their face, lips, hands, and feet can also give you clinical signs. Normal respiratory rates are listed here. For children that you see in school, you may see them roughly between 14 to 15 beats per minute as well as 12 to 22 beats per minute based on their age. Respiratory rates are one of those assessing uh, pieces that's important to do when their child is distracted. So for example, letting them know you're going to listen to their heart and as you do, you're also listening for their respiratory rate and counting it at the same time. Children will often hold their breath or change their respiratory pattern if they know you are listening. Moving into palpation. This is a tactile exam used in the finger pads to assess for any growths, growths, masses, pain, or asymmetry. Assess areas over such places as the lymph nodes, shoulders, axillary, bottom of the rib cage, and spine. Percussion is another nursing tool that can be used in the school setting if you're familiar with it. This is the method of tapping body parts to elicit sounds that determine the size, consistency, and borders of body organs. 
Percussion can help to assess for the presence or absence of fluid in a body area. In the picture, you can see normal sounds that are heard when you're percussing over certain body organs. Renaissance is a low pitched sound that is hollow. This is what you would find over the lungs because they are air filled. Dullness is a sound that is quiet and it's in short duration. It's a quiet thud. This is normal to hear over dense tissues such as the liver. Hearing dullness over an area such as the intestines would be abnormal. This could represent that the intestines are either filled with stool, meaning constipation, bile obstruction, or even some sort of mass. Percussion is a technique that should be practiced often to get used to it. It is best to keep the fingernails clipped short and only do two taps on the pleximeter finger in each location and focus on listening to the sounds. Next is auscultation. This is an important part of the respiratory assessment to assess airflow through the tracheal bronchial tree. It is best to listen sitting upright, but in an event where a student is acutely ill, you can also listen from side to side. Start with a systematic approach of auscultating from the front to the back and comparing side to side. You'll use the diaphragm of the stethoscope to listen to. It is best to listen to, to the sounds of the lungs over a thin layer of clothing so you can keep the student's privacy, but also minimize the amount of friction or rub sounds that may come from the stethoscope rubbing on the clothing. Also avoid listening over any bones or breast tissue. Instruct your student to breathe in and out of their mouth slowly to avoid hyperventilation. Listen through an entire inspiration and expiration. In the event of a student being short of breath, it may be helpful to start at the basis and progress upward as tolerated. Moving on to the posterior side, similar to the anterior, starting at the apex, and working side to side down to the bases of the lungs. Utilizing certain bony landmarks can help you assess which lung fields you are in. For example, finding C7 to T3 can help you locate the areas of the upper lungs and areas from T3 to T10 can help assess areas of the lower lungs. Sometimes the Students are very tiny and it's hard to get enough space to place your stethoscope on. In those events, ask the student to pull their arms forward, which will open up the scapula from the spine. Now, when you're listening to your lungs, what are you listening to? What is normal? Here are some normal breath sounds and they can depend on where they occur in the respiratory system. Remember, listen to one full cycle of inspiration and expiration in all chest areas and compare side to side, both anterior and posterior. Vesicular breath sounds are normal breath sounds. They are low pitched, soft, and heard during inspiration and expiration. Bronchial sounds are also normal, heard over the trachea and larynx. Bronchial breath sounds would not be normal if they were heard over the lung fields. If so, this could indicate consolidation. Click on the link below to hear more normal breath sounds. Now let's review abnormal breath sounds that are common to find in a school setting. The first is wheezing, as many students have a childhood condition called asthma. Wheezing is a high-pitched continuous whistling sound that may be worse on expiration. And this is due because of the airways are, are constricted due to bronchial constriction and some mucosal edema. Wheezing that is heard on inspiration and expiration should be a concern because this could indicate that the lung fields are very tight. Also take note if you only hear wheezing in one lung field, this could indicate a foreign body obstruction. Fine crackles, also known as rails, are brief discontinuous popping sounds, often similar to sounds of a fire crackling. 
This is associated with fluid accumulation in the alveolar and interstitial spaces. This could be an indication of pneumonia. Next on our list is coarse crackles or ronchi. This is continuous, low pitch rattling sound. Oftentimes, this is heard on inspiration and expiration as air is moving through larger airways that have excess amounts of mucus or secretions. With ronchi, many people may need some bronchial hygiene therapy, such as chest physiotherapy, which includes postural drainage, cushion, vibration, coffin, and suctioning. And breathing exercises may be beneficial, which include huffing and diaphragmatic breathing. Next on our list is stridor. This is a loud, low pitch whistling sound heard during inspiration. This is due to a mechanical obstruction of the trachea or upper airway narrowing. Group has a common distinct sound of stridor. Last is a pleural friction rub. This is due to inflammation of the pleura and it results from the friction as the surfaces rub together and it creates a leather creaking sound. Now, why are we concerned with abnormal breath sounds? Let's review some conditions of abnormal breath sounds. The first is epiglottitis. This is when the small cartilage over the windpipe swells. This is a life-threatening edema and swelling. A child may present with fever, sore throat, muffled voice, and respiratory distress. Do not put a child on their back. Epiglottitis is common uh, to be caused in children who have influenza type B bacteria. Next is croup. This is inflammation of the larynx, trachea, and bronchioles that cause the vocal cords to become swollen and have a distinct bark and cough with an inspiratory strider. Bronchial lithis is a common lung infection that causes swelling, irritation, and buildup of mucus. This is caused by viruses such as RSV, and it also presents with coughing, sweet, sneezing, and prolonged expiratory phase. This can last one to two weeks. Pertussis, also known as whooping cough, this is a highly contagious respiratory infection spread by droplets. Students may also present with a low-grade fever, rapping cough, high-pitched inhalation with a whoop sound. Influenza and pneumonia are also causes of abnormal breast sound in children. And they may present with symptoms such as fever, chills, chest pain, and cough. Last on our list is asthma. Symptoms can vary student to student. They may include such things as shortness of breath, chest tightness and wheezing, or trouble sleeping. Students may require rapid relief of an inhaler while in school. Education around triggers and reducing known risk factors will benefit the student in controlling their asthma symptoms. Now let's move on to the cardiac conduction system. The cardiac heart muscle is made up of specialized cells and nodes that control the heartbeat. The first is the sinoatrial node, also known as the natural pacemaker of the heart. The SA node is located in the right atrium, and it sends an electrical impulse across both atria, resulting in an atrial contraction, also called atrial systole. The blood is moving from the atria into the ventricles. The autonomic nervous system controls how fast or slowly the SA node sends signals. The impulses converge at the atrioventricle node. Here, the AV node acts to delay the impulses so that the atria have enough time to fully eject blood into the ventricles. Next, the excitation phase passes into the atrioventricular bundle, also called the bundle of his. This serves to transmit the electrical impulses from the AV node to the Purkinje fibers of the ventricles. The Purkinje fibers are a network of cells located in the subendocardial surface. They rapidly transmit 
cardiac action potentials to the myocardium of the ventricles, allowing a coordinated ventricular contraction, also known as ventricular systole. This is when blood is moved from the right and left ventricles to the pulmonary artery in aorta, respectively. The heart is made up of chambers and valves, and this is what helps to hold blood in certain areas as the heart is contracting. The upper chambers are made up of the right and left atria, which receive incoming blood. The lower chambers of the left and right ventricles pump blood out of the heart. In a cardiac exam, it will be similar as your respiratory, where you'll combine your information from a subjective and objective assessment. During this period, looking at different factors that help give you information about the student. Let's go over an example of dizziness. Some questions you may want to find out are, and are there any warning signs? Does the student have any aura? Have they passed out before? And does this occur with any postural changes? When did it start? How frequent? And does it occur with any activities such as post-eating, while exercising, or when standing up? Continue moving through your assessment and understanding each piece, such as medications, amount of sleep, and stress. Inspection of the chest will help give you some information of abnormal movements of the chest, symmetry, and coloration. Begin by listening without a device, and then move on to using your stethoscope. Respiratory movement, looking at the rate, rhythm, depth, and quality. Palpation can also be used as you're examining the extremities of your patient, starting with the capillary refill. This is a test of the perfusion of blood by blanching and counting for how long the pink color returns. Heaves or thrills can also be palpated. The apical pulse can be felt to the left of the mid clavicular line at the fifth intercostal space. Take a note of the rhythm. Is it irregular? Are there any extra heart sounds? And is the rhythm fast or slow? Normal pulse rates are noted here in this chart. School-age children tend to have a pulse rate between 70 and 100 beats per minute. Common places to palpate include the radial, carotid, apical, and brachial pulse. Starting with the radial pulse, use the three pads of your finger and follow along the radius bone on the lateral side of the wrist to palpate the radial pulse. Use enough pressure to press down and feel the palpation, but not so much that it stops the force. Best practice is to count for a full 60 seconds, assessing for rhythm, rate, force of pulsation, and pulse equality by comparing the sides. Next is the use of a carotid pulse. Again, still using the pads of the first three fingers to gently palpate. You'll locate the carotid artery between the sternoid mastoid muscle and the trachea. Gently apply pressure so that you can feel the pulse without overpressing that could cause a vagal stimulation as well as compromise any blood flow to the brain. The carotid pulse is used in emergencies because it is the last to disappear when the heart is not pumping adequate amounts of blood. Never palpate both carotids at the same time. The next on our list is the apical pulse, which requires the use of the stethoscope. It is the most accurate pulse. Have your student, student in a supine position. Working through your placements of the intercostal spaces, find the space between the fifth and sixth ribs of the left side of the body. 
This is called the point of maximal impulse. A mnemonic to help you remember where the valves are is all patients effectively take medication, aortic, pulmonic, herbs point, tricuspid, and the mitral valve. As you work your way, moving over each valve, remember that these areas correlate to the valvular sounds. The pulmonic valve opens at the systolic phase of the cardiac cycle. This is when deoxygenated blood is pumped to the right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation. The tricuspid valve controls blood from the right atria, which is the top chamber, to the right ventricle, bottom chamber. The mitral valve controls blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle. This is known as the S1 sound when the mitral valve opens. As you move through each location, listen for a full minute for the heart sounds, then repeat all five locations using the bell side of your stethoscope. Make a note that you're listening for the S1 and S2, which is referred to as lub dub. S1 is the closure of the atrioventricle valves, which are the tricuspid and mitral valve. Some tips to remember is to avoid listening over any bony areas such as the clavicle, sternum, and fatty tissue such as breast tissue for best sound transmission. Below is a link to listen to some heart sounds. During your assessment, you may notice sounds that don't sound as normal or abnormal heart sounds. These can be heard with congenital heart diseases, arrhythmias, or even valve dysfunction. Some examples include a click. A clicking sound can come from a valve that is flapping or snapping against the other when they close. A murmur is caused by rapid choppy blood flow through the heart. Some heart murmurs are innocent and do not require any treatment, whereas others can be a sign of a serious heart condition. S3 and S4 are abnormal heart sounds that may indicate signs of heart failure during the diastolic period. A pleural friction rub is also another abnormal heart sound that may be heard with someone who is feeling some chest pain. In summary, document all your unexpected findings, contact the parent or guardian, and in acute situations, if a student is unstable, call 911. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.